Hypokalemia would be when potassium levels are less than 3.5. Can be a combination, uh, a complication of Lasix and other loop diuretics. If your patient is alkalotic, which means a high pH greater than 7.45, the more alkalotic, the more likely we are to have potassium shifting into the cell out of the serum. Can also see it with endocrine disorders and can see it with GI losses. Now, let's go back to the 12 lead EKG looking for clues. The A waveform, again, we have normal sinus rhythm with a potassium level that is 3.5 to 5. By that B waveform, potassium is down to 3, and we start to see an elevation of the U wave. So I start to see an extra bump in my T wave. Now, have you heard of the U wave? Yeah, when you look at this first waveform up here, you see a little bump right after the T wave. That U wave is normal. Okay, we expect to see a, a possible little bump there. It's thought to be the repolarization of either the Purkinje fibers or the papillary muscle. That's what we think causes a U wave. It becomes a clue to us if the U wave is either elevated or if it has a negative deflection. Okay, if it has a negative deflection, it can be a clue to ischemia. And if it's elevated, it's usually a clue to either DIG toxicity or to electrolyte abnormalities. So with hypokalemia, we certainly expect to see an elevation in the U wave. So again, at B, we're at about a, a potassium of 3. By the time we're at C, potassium is down to 2, and that U wave is higher than the T wave. And by D, we have a potassium of 1. Now, once we get down into the 1 zone, that U wave is so elevated, we're at risk of mistaking it for being the T wave. Quick reminder, you don't want to let your patient get a potassium less than 2. If they get a potassium less than 2 and they go into a VTAC or a V-fib arrest, they won't take a shock until you get their potassium greater than 2. And as you know, we can't push IV potassium on our patient as I'd hate to kill my already dead patient. So typically, the closer they get to 2, the more aggressive we get replacing it, trying to keep ourselves from getting into that scenario. If I have a choice of replacing potassium IV or orally, which one hangs around longer? You got it, oral. You got it. Oral is always preferred. And by oral, I mean either orally or through a feeding tube. Research shows that oral replacement of potassium hangs around up to a third longer than IV. If I don't have oral as an option, I'm going to have to do IV. And if all you have are peripheral IVs, I am stuck at 10 milliequivalents an hour. And that means it may take me a long time to get the job done, and I may have to give you a lot of volume to get the job done. If you have a central line, we can give you 20 milliequivalents an hour. And by a central line, that could be a PIC, an internal jugular, a subclavian, a porta cath a tunnel catheter like a Hickman or a Broviac, a funnel, uh, a femoral line, any of those are our central lines. And if you're giving your K, giving your K, giving your K, and you're not seeing the expected gains you think you should be seeing, check your magnesium. Remember, you need normal magnesium levels to hold on to your potassium. Okay, you may have to give some mag to be able to hold on to your K.